All right, so we're gonna get started. So uh, thanks everybody for joining me this morning. Um, so this is gonna be just kind of a, a you know, fairly quick and fast paced look at um, macro photography and particularly how I approach macro photography. Um, so for those who don't know me, my name is August Jackson. I'm the interpretation coordinator at Mount Pisgah Arboretum where I've worked for almost nine years now. Um, and uh, this is part of a kind of virtual series of, of talks and lectures that um, we've been doing uh, since we kind of shut down most of our in-person educational operations um, in March with the start of, of the pandemic. So um, we've been doing several of these, um, trying to do, you know, kind of on average about one a month. Um, and I've had a lot of people ask me in the past to do something on macro photography. Um, so, so doing that here, um, we are going to be starting up uh, some limited in-person educational opportunities at the Arboretum again soon, just some outdoor nature walks with social distancing and masks um, limited to about 10 people. So we'll be starting those up next month kind of a trial basis and you know moving things a little bit back to uh, a semi-normal um, but uh, with that I think I'll, I'll begin so um, just an introduction to myself um, as as a photographer um, I really you know I, I had an interest in photography from a young age um, and started photographing primarily birds because uh, I was really interested in ornithology um, and I got a, a Nikon film camera, a Nikon film SLR camera um, for my birthday at the age of 11 or 12. Um, and then a, a family friend gave me a 400 millimeter lens. And so I was playing around with bird, bird photography um, and then sort of fell you know, out of that for a while. Um, and just had a point and shoot camera, um, one of the kind of cheapo ones for a number of years. Um, but then started finding uh, an interest in um, kind of a rekindled interest in botany and then a new interest in insects and entomology. Um, and so I uh, decided to pick up a digital SLR and a macro lens. And the, you know, intention of it was really to use photography for science communication. Um, so I never really and still don't really approach it as strictly, you know, making a, a piece of art. It's really primarily for me um, to use in, in science communication, whether that's in a publication or in presentations. Um, so that's really how I approach photography um, myself. And that's a bit different from, you know, a lot of people and, and many of you who'd like to, to do photography also just for the artistic uh, purposes. Um, but I do that as well. Um, it's not just about the science and I always try to make a good looking image and there are a lot of techniques um, that we'll talk about for, for making that happen. Um, the other thing is a lot of these pictures are going to be of bees and many of you know my interest in bees, um, but I actually taught myself bee identification initially through um, the lens of my camera. So um, as I was uh, really exploring the world of insects, I began learning to identify bees by taking photos of them and by observing them through uh, my macro lens. And that has, you know, expanded far, far since then. Um, but that was uh, a real initial interest of mine and kind of got me into um, studying bees and got me to where I am today. So um, there's a huge potential just for also enjoying the world um, and seeing the world differently um, through macro photography. So quick outline of uh, what we'll talk about today. We'll start with some very basics, what is macro photography? Um, and then we'll look at some tools for macro photography. I'll show you what I use. Um, and then we'll just kind of dig into some of the technical aspects. So we'll look at focusing, depth of field, shutter speed and ISO, um, and then we'll talk about flash photography, which is something um, I do uh, most of the time. Um, and we'll also look at the use of uh, tripods or monopods or other, other stabilizing devices. And then I'll talk about just kind of my basic approach and most of the time when I'm um, help looking to take photos. And then just some kind of finish off with some basic tips. Um, 
So how we'll handle question and answers is predominantly, um, you know, I think we'll have that kind of at the end of the presentation. I'll stop, um, I'll, I'll quit sharing the screen, and then I'll encourage you to um, ask questions. We'll use the, uh, the chat function. If you can find it, just type in a question mark in the chat box, um, and then I'll call on you. If you can't find the chat function um, or have issues with that, feel free to just turn on your mic and jump in. Um, but there are a couple times during the presentation where I want to pause for questions too, just so that um, some of the issues are fresh on your mind. Um, partic particularly, people frequently have questions about um, aperture and depth of field. So after that segment, and that's kind of halfway through anyway, I just want to pause and I'll um, kind of open things up for, for questions at that point. Um, but otherwise, we'll, we'll save the rest of it for the end. Um, so uh, we'll just jump right in now. Um, so what is macro photography? And that seems sort of like a silly question, um, but it's actually, um, there are a lot of definitions depending on who you ask. And sort of the, the purest idea of what macro photography is, is uh, a one-to-one -one, um, replication of an image. And that doesn't mean that the image is life size. What it actually means is that um, an object the size of your camera sensor will completely fill your camera sensor. So a 35 millimeter sensor, a 35 millimeter object will completely fill that sensor. And so that will uh, produce an image where the 35 millimeter object is taking up the entirety of the sensor. And then if you blow that up to you know, the, the maximum print size, you're going to get something where um, you have a 35 millimeter insect, for example, that is you know, now um, represented at 24 inches, etc. So it's it's much greater than life size. It's actually a huge magnification, um, and so the one to one that you see on macro lenses generally refers to, or always refers to, really that um, filling of of your camera's sensor. Um, some of the challenges there are that a lot of camera sensors or, or macro lenses are usually built for a certain size of camera sensor. So um, if you're looking uh, dealing with Canon or Nikon DSLRs, most of their macro lenses are built for 35 millimeter sensors, but you can also use them on crop sensor cameras, um, and that's what I use them on. So a smaller sensor, so you actually get a little bit more magnification out of it if you're using a crop sensor camera. Um, but there are other, you know, kind of looser definitions of macro photography, and that's, you know, that really anything where you're blowing up an image to larger than life size. Um, so, uh, you know, if you look at this um, flower on the left side of the screen, um, this is a uh, Castellasia exerta. It's a, a paintbrush species, and um, this is not reproduced, you know, nearly one to one, but it's magnified tremendously. So this is a fairly small plant. Um, this is def definitely a macro photograph. Where you kind of get out of that range a little bit is when you start, um, say, photographing uh, a rattlesnake that's, you know, three, four, five feet away. Um, you're still reproducing it much larger than life size, um, but it's not, you know, using, it's not strictly macro in that, in that really purest sense but you're still going to be using your camera, um, your tripod, your flash, whatever, in the exact same ways you would be if you're taking you know, a true macro photograph. Um, so we'll, we'll kind of uh, just conflate the two for the purposes of, of talking about um, you know, techniques. Um, you can also go much more than one-to-one. -one. Um, usually macro photography includes up to um, 10 by magnification, and then beyond that, um, it's considered micro photography. Um, we're not going to be looking at any magnification greater than um, one to one today. Uh, that's the only macro lens I use in the field. I do have another, um, which I'll actually show you in just a moment. Um, so with that, we're actually just gonna, I'm gonna stop screen sharing for a moment to show you um, some of what I use. So um, this is my camera um, with my 100 millimeter lens attached. So the 100 millimeter um, 
Canon macro lens is the only lens I use um, in the field for macro photography. Um, and it's a, an excellent lens. I really like the 100 millimeter focal length. You can find macro lenses in 50 millimeters, 60 millimeters, 100 millimeters, um, 180 millimeters. Um, this is kind of a really nice, just standard mid range. Um, it allows you to get really close to your subject when you need to um, and when you want to. And often I find myself wanting to. Um, so you can you know, take photographs where your subject is about that far from the front of the lens. Um, and that's really helpful, particularly if you're trying to take photos of a moving insect that's among dense vegetation. You want to be able to push the vegetation out of the way and not have it um, kind of in front of the lens um, blocking your view of the insect. And that's an issue you would have with a 180 millimeter lens, for example, that has a much longer working distance where the closest you can get to your subject is maybe like that. So um, a lot of considerations like that for the type of lens you might you know, want to use. Um, but this is what I use, what I um, have used, except for the camera, um, for um, eight years now. And then the other thing that almost always stays on my camera is this flash. It's a Canon Speedlight. It's a pretty large, powerful flash. Um, you actually don't need one this powerful. Um, I think it was, it was a purchase I made um, initially. If I could go back, I would get a smaller one, possibly. It's an excellent flash, don't get me wrong. Um, I love it, but it's more than is necessary. Um, and then there's this diffuser, which always stays on the front of the flash and helps make the light a little softer. Um, we'll talk about flash photography a little more here in a bit. Um, some of the other options, um, I have another flash that I use for studio photography, um, but it uh, is just kind of an example of some of the flash options out there. So this is a flash that will fit on the front of your camera lens and it has two flashes on the side so it can sit there um, get the light really close to the subject you can also remove each of these flashes and then you know move them around as you choose to um, stretch pretty far out or you can just attach them um, to the side of the flash head and have them sit there like that so this is a pretty neat little unit um, a lot of people, people particularly who really like to kind of play around with their lighting, use flash units like this. Um, I'll talk about why I don't use this in the field um, a bit later. Um, and that's mostly just because I don't like fiddling with things like that. Um, and then the other thing I use in studio photography is this funky little lens that goes from 2.5 to 5 times magnification. Um, and so this is for some just super, super close ups um, and something I wouldn't use outside in the field taking pictures because the depth of field is so poor. So um, what I have to do and why I use it in the studio is I take a bunch of images that then get stacked and I can't do that really um, effectively in the field with the subject matter I usually photograph. And then the last piece of equipment that I use occasionally um, is tripod. Um, so this is a pretty bulky, heavy, sturdy tripod, um, but again, bulky and heavy. Um, and so I don't use it too often, except in, in certain situations. I'll talk about those situations soon. Um, so that's really my equipment. Um, the camera, honestly, is probably the least important piece of that in terms of the, um, the, the technology there. So you really don't need a fancy camera um, for macro photography at least because you're not going to be using um, a lot of the technology that they're building in the cameras these days. So a lot of the higher priced cameras have technology that's made for um, you know photographers that are specializing in action photography, bird photography, um, or you know portraiture, wedding photography, things like that. Um, a lot of those functions you're just not going to be using in macro photography. Photography. So for the first five or six years, I was shooting with a $300 Canon Rebel, 
and it was doing just fine. Um, I upgraded my camera a couple years ago to a Canon 80D, which I, I love um, and will, you know, ideally last me another 10 years because I don't really need that technology upgrade at this point unless they, they come up with something magical soon. So um, your camera for, for this type of photography is not super important. Um, the lens is important. And then um, depending on the kind of uh, images you want to take, your flash, your tripod can be pretty important. Okay, so now I'm gonna uh, share my screen again. So start off um, with talking about some of the technical aspects by uh, just looking at focusing, which obviously is, is important in any type of photography, but really important in macro photography where you're dealing with um, pretty small subject matter. So my personal preference is to um, always use manual focus. Um, and that's, that's just something that um, I do and always have done. Um, and the reason for that is when you're dealing with um, photographing anything at close range, your camera, if you're using autofocus, it's, it's really easy for it to get confused because it's complex subject matter, um, often complex backgrounds, particularly if there's a lot of foliage around. Um, so it's difficult for your camera to figure out what you're trying to focus on. Um, but there are ways around that. And there are a lot of reasons that people might be comfortable only using autofocus. Um, so if you're comfortable, you know, most comfortable using autofocus and really only want to use autofocus, um, what I would encourage you to do is just really familiarize yourself with how your camera's autofocus system works. Um, cat uh, camera autofocus systems are getting more and more um, complex and sophisticated and advanced to where, uh, you know, they're getting close to being very good at anticipating what you're wanting to photograph, even in a complex uh, macro situation. Um, and you can make it easier on yourself by going into your camera settings and figuring out what autofocus settings will work best for macro photography. So a lot of these settings are super complex. Um, and we're not going to get into them, um, but you'll want to take a look if you're using autofocus um, on what's going to work best for you and experiment with that. Um, another good way to get around the problems with autofocusing are just to uh, prioritize still subjects, so something that's not moving. Um, then you have a lot of time to work with your camera's autofocus system and make sure it's picking up on the right thing. Um, and then simple backgrounds help a lot too. Um, so if you look at this image here on the right, it's a really simple background. It would have been pretty easy for my camera to pick out what I wanted to focus on here. Um, and then apply extra lighting, particularly on the subject. Um, and that will help your camera kind of figure out what you're wanting to photograph. Um, just broadly, whether you're manually focusing or using autofocus, Increasing the aperture value on your camera is going to help a lot with um, getting more in focus shots. And there's actually, you know, a pretty good example here in this photo on the right side. So this is a male uh, Hoplitis fulgita. It's a really beautiful native bee. Um, and I love this image, but it's a tiny bit out of focus. Uh, if you look closely, the um, focus is more, on the center of the flower. I would love the focus to be perfect on the bee's eye, um, but he moved just a little bit while I was taking the photograph. And so that eye got just a little bit out of focus, um, but it's, it's not very noticeable. It's just a little softer than I would like. So I still really, really love this image. Um, and part of what helped to allow for that, um, you know, that little bit of error there uh, without having, you know, a, a completely blown image is that um, there was a, a pretty large uh, depth of field. So um, the depth of field is really important in allowing for a margin of error 
with moving subjects because if they move a bit, they're not gonna move all the way out of focus. They might move just a little bit out of, you know, your sharpest area of focus, but you're still, you're still getting a pretty good image. So, um, whoops, on to the next slide. Um, let's talk about that aperture and depth of field. So the aperture values on your camera determine how much light reaches your camera sensor while also affecting how much of the image is in focus. So the higher the F value, the smaller the aperture, and that can be kind of confusing, but the greater the F value, so if you're at F16 or F18 or F20, the smaller the aperture, you know, F18, that's a just tiny little, tiny aperture. Um, so that's going to make the image darker but it's also at the same time going to increase the depth of field. So a lot of lenses and uh, this macro lens that I use starts out at, oh, let's see, um, 2.8, uh, so f2.8, uh, but that would be a super, super shallow depth of field. I never, never shoot at apertures that low. Um, usually shooting around f9 to f11. I'll talk about that a little more soon. Um, but it really affects kind of the, the quality and feel of your image. So this is a, a photo of an American ruby spot damselfly here on the right. And um, it's shot at f5.6, so one of the lowest apertures I shoot at. Um, but because I wasn't directly in front of the subject, I wasn't right up against it, um, you actually get a lot of it in focus. And then it's kind of pleasantly um, going out of focus along the length of its abdomen and along the wings. Um, and that's, you know, partly because I was far enough away from it. If I was right up close to it with that aperture, um, I would only have the face in focus. It wouldn't be as nice of an image. Um, but with that bit of distance, um, I get a little more depth of field. So you know, you're, you're kind of, you can increase your, or at least the perception of depth of field by standing further away from your subject. So the aperture impacts the sharpness of the image quite a lot. Um, at lower apertures, like kind of your camera or your lens's base aperture, it's going to be a little soft. And then at higher apertures, um, you're going to start to get some diffraction. So usually the middle apertures um, are going to kind of be the sharpest. Um, it has a huge effect on the quality of light and it's crucial for establishing the feel of an image. So over here on the left is a picture of um, Trillium ovatum on the forest floor. And this was kind of in a, a fairly dark forest, um, but I loved the way the dappled light was coming through the trees and I really loved the way um, it was, not just coming through the trees and shining on the flower, but also shining on the forest behind. Um, so I really wanted to capture that. And how I was able to do that is by um, lowering my aperture, so allowing more light in, um, and just really kind of honing in on particularly, you know, the exact kind of lighting that I wanted in the image, which is what I was seeing, um, you know, out there in the field looking at it. But it's often it often takes a little work to replicate in your camera what you're seeing and particularly the, the feeling of the light that you're seeing. Um, so aperture is really crucial for, for that. Um, it also can impact the scientific value of the image. So as I was talking a lot of, um, you know, for most of the photos I'm taking, the intention is at least in part to have an image that's useful for science communication. So it can show, um, certain physiological aspects of either a plant or an insect or a mushroom that are important in identification or important for talking about um, the ecology of the species. Um, so aperture can be really, really significant in that because um, it, generally, if I'm taking a close-up photo, I want a greater depth of field to show more of the physiological characteristics. For example, if I'm always shooting at a low aperture like I was doing with this trillium, but I'd move closer to the trillium, um, I would only, you know, have the very center of the flower in focus. And that wouldn't be 
you know, helpful for um, some other applications. Um, and then again, it uh, really impacts the, the clarity of the image. And um, that's important at those really high apertures. So F16, F18, F20, where you start to get diffraction um, and uh, you start to get a little muddiness to the, the image. Do you want to take just a quick uh, break here for a moment for any questions? So um, if you have a question before we move on, um, feel free to, to type something quickly in the chat. I'll pull up the chat function on the side. Um, just type a, a question mark if you have a question. I'll give uh, 30 seconds for that to show up. Otherwise, we can save questions to the end. Okay, we'll keep moving on. So shutter speed and ISO are um, interesting ways to affect um, the lighting in, in lieu of the aperture. So I tend to try to keep my aperture at about you know, F7 to F13. So in, in a fairly small range, um, where I'm, I'm looking at a, a pretty good depth of field consistently. So that's always allowing um, less light in than would be ideal. Um, so ways to, to kind of um, uh, counteract that or accommodate that are to work with shutter speed and ISO. So these are great tools for managing light. Um, the interesting thing about shutter speed is that it's relatively inconsequential with macro photography um, in, in a lot of circumstances. And one is if you're photographing still subjects and you're using a tripod, then your shutter speed really doesn't matter. Um, it can be, you know, as low as 1 20th of a second, or it can be, you know, even um, a several second long shutter speed, which I sometimes do um, if I'm photographing mushrooms in a dark forest. Um, it's also fairly inconsequential if you're using a flash. Uh, so flash is really interesting in um, the way that it works. A lot of the um, high quality flashes are sending out a really quick burst of light. And that quick burst of light is uh, powerful enough to usually freeze an image onto your camera sensor. Um, so your shutter speed can be at 1 1 25th of a second or 1 1 60th of a second, which is where I tend to leave it. Um, but capture movement, that's more like 1 1 1,000th of a second. And that's because the flash of light overpowers um, the majority of the ambient light. And so your camera is just recording uh, what happened during that 1 1 1,000th of a second flash of light. Right, so it's recording that light hitting the, the camera sensor. So um, the flash is super helpful in um, freezing movement in a macro photograph. And this is a, an excellent example here of it on the right, where I was taking an image of this mining bee, Andrina anisoclora, taking off from um, this flower, where it's just collecting massive amounts of pollen. And so this bee is um, you know, moving pretty quickly now, it's in flight, um, and my, my, uh, shutter speed was still at, you know, about one, one sixtieth of a second. So nowhere near fast enough to capture the image without motion blur, unless I was using flash. So, um, one huge benefit of flash, and I'll talk more about that later, but, um, you know, whether you're using a tripod or using flash, um, you don't need to worry too much about, um, shutter speed. So that's, you can, you can bump that shutter speed down really low um, and that allows you to have a higher aperture. Um, ISO is another great tool. So a greater ISO allows for increased aperture and or shutter speed at the expense of increased noise. Um, so if you uh, started out shooting on film cameras, um, you're used to these um, kind of film speed numbers, right? Um, you have 100, uh, 400 was really common for, you know, taking photos of your kids playing soccer. 
Um, you had eight uh, speeds of 800 that were often used in action photography, like bird photography. Um, so the, the digital ISO numbers are really the same thing. Um, and it's just uh, really referring to the sensitivity of your camera's sensor. Um, there have been huge, huge advancements in um, ISO in cameras in recent years. And that's actually one of the, the few reasons to upgrade uh, your camera. You know, if your camera's 10 years old, there have been some tremendous advancements in this area in recent years where um, the noise levels in, in you know, pretty high um, ISOs are not bad. And so the higher the ISO, the more light um, is reaching your camera sensor. So you can take shots in, in some really dark situations. So on the right here, this is a picture of a, cam a picture of a camera, a picture of a mushroom um, on Mount Rainier in a dark forest. This is the um, Admiral, Admirable Bully, a beautiful little mushroom. And this was taken with 1000 ISO. Um, so no tripod, um, no flash. Um, and the reason for that is that uh, I didn't have a tripod with me and a flash would have kind of ruined the quality of light in this picture. Um, but you can't really notice the noise. So this is zoomed in, this is cropped. Um, you can't notice uh, you know, a problematic level of grain in this image at 1000 ISO. So that's another great way to uh, allow more light into your camera, which again allows you to increase your aperture. Here's another example of that, and this was a photo I took right after I got my new camera, which had better ISO capabilities. So this is also shot at 1000 ISO. And this is a picture of one of my favorite animals. This is a lined shore crab. And on the Oregon coast, um, in our kind of, uh, particularly the central Oregon coast, where you have these amazing basalt tide pools, um, these guys like to hang out um, in the cracks in the basalt. Um, and this was late December, um, sunset, the light was low. I really liked the feel of the light. Um, and I tried initially taking photos of this crab with flash and it was just blowing everything out. Um, but it was so dark um, that I had to, to get the um, light reflecting off the tide pool from the sun onto um, this crab's you know, head and face. Um, I had to, to uh, lower, or excuse me, raise my ISO up to about 1000. And on my old camera, that would have made things look terrible. Um, but this one, you can hardly notice the grain. So there have been huge advancements there. Um, and it's a really fun way to be able to um, kind of play with your camera settings to get the quality of light that you want. Um, and this isn't, you know, a spectacular image, but I like the, uh, the feel of it really kind of feel like you're in a tide pool. So uh, let's talk about flash quickly. Um, flash is really my favorite tool for macro photography because it applies a soft, even lighting, at least when you're using a diffuser. So again, this is a diffuser I use. A lot of people make homemade diffusers for their flashes um, and some with excellent results. Um, if you want to take the time to make a homemade diffuser and really dial in um, what you basically want to get out of your lighting, you can get almost exactly what you want. Um, people make really complex, bizarre looking diffusers. Um, for me, I don't, I'm not as concerned. Um, this works the vast majority of the time and it's $14 on Amazon and it doesn't look bizarre and use all kinds of um, household equipment um, and it doesn't weigh my camera down more. So um, I, I really prefer using just a, a cheap little diffuser. Um, flash is amazing because it counteracts harsh light of, of sun, um, counteracts the shadows uh, produced by the sun, and it counteracts glare. So um, not only does it allow more lighting in a situation where there's not a lot of light, but it also can counteract some of the challenges produced by really intense light, um, particularly at midday. So a lot of my subject matter, whether it's um, 
going to be bees or flies or butterflies or uh, reptiles. Um, more commonly found uh, kind of in the day when the lighting is pretty intense. Um, so the flash really helps counteract that intense light. Um, it permits a greater depth of field by providing uh, an alternative source of lighting. Um, so that's uh, hugely important in my work. Um, and it helps to freeze motion, as we talked about briefly. Um, some of the main downsides are that the flash can be too harsh, even at low settings, even with diffusion um, in certain situations. And we'll talk about those situations a little more, but um, they tend to be um, in dark forests um, where there's just not a lot of light reaching the forest floor. The flash can make things look really unnatural. Um, and also with, with um, kind of wet subject matter, so mushrooms, amphibians, um, the just kind of moistness on the, the surface of the mushroom cap or on the body of a, a frog um, reflects the light in really uh, unattractive ways often. Um, so I've seen some, some excellent photographers who specialize in photographing mushrooms and amphibians who have you know, really dialed in their flash um, and their diffusion and have gotten around that. But um, for me, um, since that's not my main subject matter, I'm not taking the time with that. So I'm not using a flash in those situations. Uh, another downside is it makes your camera bulkier and heavier. So with my flash and diffuser attached to my camera with a 100 millimeter macro lens on it, we're looking at about five pounds. Um, so not something you want to hold in one hand. Um, and definitely flash is not recommended in rainy conditions. So this flash I've had for about eight years now. Um, and I have completely killed it three times um, in, in wet conditions. Um, each time it has come back to life after pulling out the batteries and allowing it to dry. Um, but it's a, a good reminder that it does not play well in wet weather. Uh, so we'll just look at a few photos of uh, where, you know, I'm using flash in a way that um, is really um, effective in a way that, you know, I, frankly, the flash, in my opinion, is the most important piece of equipment that I have for taking the kind of macro photographs that I like to take. Um, so this is a mining bee in a um, fawn lily. And this was a, a dark, cloudy spring day. So the, the light is already really diffused, um, which creates a really soft natural lighting, but it's way too dark to get the kind of detail I wanted um, on the subject without flash. Um, and this remains one of my favorite photos that I've ever taken because the, the combination of those cloudy skies with a soft natural light and the soft light of the flash um, just just uh, brought a ton of clarity to the image. Uh, another really similar situation here. These are two bee flies that I found um, hanging on a, an old prunella stalk. And again, um, the light was already fantastic, soft, cloudy, uh, natural light, but not enough light to give me the kind of detail I needed. So the flash just augmented that light. Um, so in these situations, and this is honestly in the Pacific Northwest, some of the best lighting um, for macro photography I find in the, the spring um, when we have these, you know, kind of overcast days, but it's not rainy um, and the sun is starting to, you know, to get stronger, it's starting to get higher in the sky, um, you can get some really beautiful lighting. Um, so here the flash is just augmenting that lighting. These are situations where the flash is being used to actually counteract um, the sun's intense lighting. So this is a sagebrush lizard hanging out on a serpentine rock. And um, it's the middle of the day. The light is bright, um, the glare is bright. Uh, the flash at, you know, at a high power can counteract um, the glare, can remove um, these you know, harsh shadows. So uh, really, really um, impactful in those situations too. There's another example of that. Um, it, can't, it can't work magic, it can't always remove um, the harsh light. So this is a colored lizard in Arizona. 
This is midday sun. Um, so there's still some harsh sunlight in this photo, uh, but the flash is removing as much of it as possible and producing um, a nice image that's pretty evenly lit where there are no, um, no problematic distracting shadows, at least on the body of the lizard. And then the other thing you can do with flash um, that is really, really fantastic and um, really useful, but only works if you have a still subject is that you can uh, really precisely dial in um, how strong you want the flash to be. So a lot of, um, a lot of flash models, particularly some of the, um, you know, more advanced, little more expensive ones will allow you to dial in the flash output. And so if you have some really nice natural lighting, um, but you just want to direct a little more lighting onto the subject while still maintaining the, the color and quality of the light that's coming from, say, a sunset, um, you can dial your flash down to, say, 1 64th the power. So you're just throwing a little bit more light at the subject. And that's, um, that's one of the things I did here with this sagebrush sheet moth. Um, I started out taking pictures of it from a little further away then realized that it was, it was going to allow me to get closer. Um, that's probably because it was just emerging, probably just pupated, um, and was still pumping hemolyph into the wings, so didn't really have the option to move around much. Um, so situations like that, I can take time to um, really think, uh, think about my lighting, think about how I want light to interact with the subject. And there was some beautiful sunlight that I wanted um, prominent in the image, but I really wanted to make sure you also could see the detail. Um, similar with this one, um, part of what I like to do with my images is also just show um, insects as individuals. And so when you find an insect that's clearly lived a really, really rough, rough life, it's probably old and near the end of its life. Um, and, uh, you know, it's remarkable that this butterfly can still even fly. Um, I really wanted to kind of capture the feeling of that too. And um, the sun, the afternoon sunlight was shining through the wings, which really kind of accentuated how tattered they were. So I wanted to make sure I could keep that. Um, but the problem was it was backlit and it would not have been a nice image without flash counteracting that and um, shining on, you know, its eyes. So you have a clear um, in focus image of the or view of the eye. Um, so flash really helped to, uh, to um, basically allow that backlighting um, while having it not be um, distracting or ruin the image. And this was an instance where um, I was able to really, really pause for a minute and dial in the flash. So this was a butterfly um, at the top of Steens Mountain um, that had kind of settled in for the night on some really low vegetation on a seed head. Um, so at the top of Steens Mountain, it gets super windy and super cold at night. So this butterfly had found a spot to just lay down until the sun hit it the next morning. Um, and I, I found this walking through the, you know, the alpine tundra there and noticed the setting sun and the, the light hitting its wing. And it was beautiful. Um, and it took me a minute to figure out how to capture that quality of the light while also, um, you know, capturing the, the butterfly um, because the light was so harsh, so bright on the section of the wing, um, but there was so little ambient light uh, because the sun was on the horizon that just taking a, a photo without flash, um, you couldn't see the butterfly's face at all. You couldn't see its legs. Uh, you could only see the wing. So dialing in a really, really low flash um, illuminated the face and body of the butterfly while allowing the um, quality of light from the, the setting sun to still show on its wing. So um, really, really love using flash. And it's great when um, you can kind of take time with a still subject 
to um, experiment and play with your lighting. Um, but there are times when I, when I don't use flash and sometimes that's just out of convenience. So you can get really good images without using a flash, particularly if you have soft light on overcast days, um, rainy days, things like that. So this is a, a bumblebee uh, species in Denali National Park and it was a rainy day and I've learned my lesson and didn't keep uh, my flash on my camera in the rain. Um, but I uh, found this bumblebee and it's a species that we don't have in Oregon or the Pacific Northwest and I figured you know, I you know, wouldn't see it again unless I went back to Alaska. Um, so I wanted to make sure I got a decent photo of it. And um, with a, you know, a fairly low aperture um, and higher ISO, um, I was able to manage a photo of it that I like quite a bit without using flash. Um, other instances where, you know, flash just gets in the way, um, and this is a similar situation as with the butterfly, but uh, setting sun, um, really making these paint brushes glow. Um, and, you know, I was walking around and just astonished by how um, the, the bracts on these paintbrushes were glowing in the setting sun um, and really wanted to try to capture that in my camera. Um, and the flash just would not have um, allowed me to capture that quality of light. It would have done a little too much in this instance to um, counteract that light. So there are plenty of times when I don't use a flash, um, but I always have it on my camera. Uh, so let's talk quickly about using a tripod or a monopod or really any sort of stabilizing device. Um, great thing is it allows for taking full advantage of natural light. So I was talking about how there are instances where the natural light is just phenomenal and you want to show that. Um, it provides an excellent feel for the image. Um, the picture on the left here are some honey mushrooms in um, the afternoon golden light of uh, early November. Um, the fall light in the Pacific Northwest can just be really incredible. Um, so I do not want to use flash here, but a tripod helps to um, allow me to take time to stabilize the image. I'm actually not sure if I used a tripod on that one or if I was laying down and using my el elbow, but it's a, a similar, um, similar idea. And there are plenty of times, often with mushrooms in forests, that I'm using a tripod. Um, the other cool thing about tripods is it can enable super precise focusing. Um, so if you're using autofocus, you can um, kind of control your focus points a little more easily um, and have it focus on um, your subject. Or if you're using manual focus, a lot of cameras will allow you to um, go to your kind of digital display for um, your camera screen, zoom in, and then uh, turn the focus ring on your lens. Um, so you can zoom in 10 times to the image and then um, get a really precise focus on exactly where you want your focal point in the image. So tripods are really awesome in that way. They can be really bulky and heavy. There are some exceptions. There's some smaller kind of flexible tripods that work for a lot of cameras, particularly lighter weight ones um, that are excellent. Um, I bought, I'm kind of a one size fits all person. So I bought a tripod for all kinds of situations that's really bulky and heavy um, and not super fun to carry around if I'm you know, hiking long distances. Um, but it is super sturdy and, and does a great job with that. Uh, tripods are also really impractical for moving subjects um, because you can't really move around with a tripod. A monopod, you can move a lot more, so um, you can kind of find a balance there. It can also be time consuming to set up shots with a tripod um, to pull out the legs, get them to the right level. Um, so for someone who uh, sometimes lacks patience, like myself, um, I don't always love setting up a shot with a, a tripod, but that's a, a personal preference. So here are some photos taken with a tripod. Um, again, I think they're really valuable in situations where um, there's not a lot of light and you need to um, make sure that your image is illuminated by um, natural light because 
in situations where there's not a lot of light, flash often just looks too harsh. So this is a photo of some elfin saddle mushrooms in a dark forest um, using a tripod um, and a really, really slow shutter speed so that I can have a, you know, again, a, a high aperture. So there's a good depth of field here. You can really see the details of these mushrooms, um, but you're also only having um, them, them illuminated by natural light. Here's another example where I'm using a tripod um, to get natural light. And I mentioned before, um, with kind of the moistness of the skin of amphibians, it can be really distracting uh, to use a flash. It can really um, create some, some um, distracting highlights. Uh, so I used a tripod in this instance. Now, these are moving subjects. They're not always going to be still. Um, but if you're uh, out looking for amphibians, salamanders um, in particular, that that kind of hang out in woody debris, at least during the day. Um, you can often find them um, um, in situations where they don't actually want to be moving much. So you can take time with them. Um, and here's a quick video of how I got the, the shots of the salamander. So my tripod is set up there. I'll play it one more time so you can see it. So um, my tripod has kind of a, a the ability to have like a, a almost a boom stick on it so I can spread out the legs and then swing the, the camera around, um, which allows for, for taking shots like that too. Whoops. Come on. So um, start wrapping things up. So my approach uh, to photography predominantly is that ease and mobility is really paramount for me. And part of that is, you know, the majority of my subject matter is bees. Um, and the majority of the time that I'm photographing bees, I also have a net in hand. Um, so I need to be able to move around um, and be, you know, doing two things at once. So I want to focus on finding subject matter and composing the photos. Um, I don't want to spend time fiddling too much with settings, except for those examples, you know, that I talked about where you have this really um, exceptional and still subject. Then it's great. It's fun to experiment. But um, in the heat of the day, in the middle of the day, when bees are, are flying all over the place and I'm you know, just taking advantage of whatever opportunities present themselves, um, I'm often given five to 10 seconds to squeeze off a few shots. Um, and this is an example here with a mating pair of Anthidium atrophrons that I encountered. And I was watching the male. Um, he was defending a territory around this plant and then in flew a female and he's, he initiated mating and I had a few seconds to take a photo. Um, so no time really to fiddle with settings. Um, so I really like to be able to almost set my camera settings and forget about them for a good chunk of the day. Um, of course, that's not how, how it really always works. Um, but in most situations I can, I can just kind of set my flash to full auto um, set my shutter speed to 1 1 25th or 1 1 60th of a second, set my aperture to F9 um, and ISO to 200. And most of the time in full sun, I'm good. And the you know, times I'm going to change that are if I'm going into uh, dappled shade um, or full shade, um, then I'm going to need to change things. But I really like to kind of leave things where they are so I can focus on um, the subject matter and the composition. Um, and you know, with that, I always use on-camera flash. So um, a lot of people, uh, particularly if they're using a tripod, like to compose their shots and then um, use off-camera flash where they're um, setting lighting from different angles and people get beautiful, beautiful effects um, from that. It's really impractical with, um, insect photography where the insects are moving around, um, if not impossible, but when you have still subject matter, that's a really um, fun thing to play with. So here are a couple photos that kind of just illustrate um, my approach and that is 
these photos that I'm showing are pretty much all at the exact same settings. They're at different times of the year um, in different places over multiple years, but they're all shot at about 1 1 60th of a second with the aperture between f9 and f11. Um, you know, it's really kind of a, a middle ground that provides a lot of flexibility, which I, which I enjoy. So this is a, a tiger beetle. And if you've ever encountered these, these are super fast and almost never slow down um, and sit still. So you've got to be um, ready to take a shot. So I wanted to be, you know, ready to focus um, precisely on the eye before it, it scuttled off another 10 feet. Um, this is an oak tree hopper and it's emerging um, from its uh, um, nymphal stage into an adult and it's surrounded by its siblings that are still nymphs. So this was the first of its siblings to transform into an adult. And I shot this photo a few years ago at Mount Pisgah Arboretum and I had been monitoring these um, oak tree hoppers uh, for about a month um, waiting for this moment to happen and I just happened to walk up at the time that it was and got really lucky there um, so I you know again the mobility um, being able to just just walk around move around and check on dif different subjects is really important to me um, I also would not have been able to get a tripod set up in time to um, take this shot um, where it's really just emerging from its exoskeleton, it's still hanging on to it, um, still pumping hemolyph into its wings. Um, so uh, just having a, a camera on my, uh, you know, around my neck with a flash attached allowed me to, to get this photo. Um, same here, again, same settings as all the others. This is Anthidium utahensi, a male. Um, it's really important for me to, to try to get this photograph because um, this species hadn't been recorded in the Willamette Valley in about a hundred years. And then here's a, um, one of our um, crescent butterflies. Again, same settings. All of these pretty much in, in pretty harsh sunlight too. So um, my tips, a lot of this is, is personal and what works for you. And it's gonna be figured out based on experimenting. Um, but your camera can make a lot of things easier, particularly if it's a newer camera. Um, they have a lot of settings. And again, I, I talked about how most of those you don't need, but look at what settings your camera has and experiment with those settings and controls because um, by doing that, you can find ways to make things easier on yourself. Um, Play around a lot with still subjects, uh, particularly if you're, you know, trying to learn um, the, the effects of different settings. So you can take, um, you know, many, many photos of the same subject um, with different settings and see how it affects different things and compare, um, and, you know, with different lighting, with or without um, a tripod, uh, things like that. Um, take huge amounts of photos. So, you know, um, I'm just old enough to have started out with a film camera. Um, and so have had the experience, especially of being young and, you know, only having like $20 as a 14 year old and um, wanting to, you know, not waste uh, my rolls of film. Um, so, you know, it's really astounding now how many photos you can take um, without worrying about the cost at all. So take tons of photos. Um, with me, with uh, my photography, I don't expect to have more than one in 50 uh, photos I shoot be one that I like, um, particularly with moving subject matter. Um, and then the other thing, and this is easier said than done, um, it's one of the things that takes the longest is um, knowing your subject matter can be really helpful to getting a good photograph. And part of that is particularly if it's a kind of subject matter that moves around, um, if it's an insect or if it's a, a reptile or a snake, you start to learn how they move um, and you can anticipate their movements a little better um, and learn to recognize when they're, they're presenting um, opportunities to take good photographs. Um, so that can be really helpful. But again, that's something that takes, uh, you know, 
quite a while to, um, to develop. And with that, I'd like to wrap things up and stop screen sharing and um, take some questions. So feel free to turn on your camera. Um, I saw some questions come in through the chat, so I will um, start taking those. So I've got a question. Um, got a question from, from Mike about flash, about what flash to use. Um, and that kind of depends on your camera. So um, there are going to be different flash manufacturers for different cameras. Um, the one that I use is for, you know, having a Canon camera is for Canon. This is a Canon Speedlight. Um, it's a 430EX2. It's, it's uh, really fantastic. Um, as I mentioned early on, I also think it's overkill and not necessary to have a flash this large. You could get by with some of their um, lower number flashes, uh, like in the 200 uh, series, um, which are also a little bit cheaper. None of these are you know, extraordinarily expensive, but then there are also some really good flashes um, made by uh, Chinese brands that you know, in the past were considered um, not great quality. Uh, that has changed substantially in recent years where the, the quality coming out of um, some of these really inexpensive um, Chinese brands, like this is a uh, Yongnuo flash, um, is just incredible, uh, rivals um, a lot of the, the big name brands. So those, those are awesome. Um, and uh, yeah, not, not too expensive either. So I recommend, you know, some of the, less expensive flashes, especially if you're just looking to, um, to experiment, to play around, and then um, look into a diffuser too. So this is um, made by Altura, and it's just a, it's basically just um, some, you know, opaque white cloth. Um, it fits over the flash. You can make your own version of these at home um, pretty easily. Some people just use a couple layers of paper towels um, the, the nice thing about a diffuser like this is it um, magnifies the size of your flash output essentially. So um, the flash is hitting the front of this and this is about I think nine inches across. And so um, your flash is essentially that big when it's entering into um, the environment. Uh, so having it spread out more really helps to illuminate more of the scene and have less of those harsh um, uh, harsh highlights. Any, uh, any other questions? Jump on in. So Lisa's asking, do I use single shots or multiple sports type settings. Okay, yeah, so some of the burst the burst shots. I always do single shots and that's because of the flash. So um, the flash needs to recharge between shots um, and that's a lot faster at lower settings, but if it's um, at higher settings, that can be slower. So it can't actually accommodate the burst shooting. So I always use single shots. However, I'm often able to get a couple uh, shots off per second. Um, so the flash recycles fast enough that I can do that. Um, but the reason for that, and this is really important, and thank you for that cue, is um, the batteries. And this is something that I had no idea about for the first few years. I was just using um, some run-of-the-mill rechargeable batteries, um, also just trying you know, your Duracell and Energizer AA batteries. But it turns out not all batteries are created equal. And there's some really fantastic rechargeable batteries that make, uh, not only do they last longer, but they um, make the flash recharge um, twice as fast at least. So um, just an excellent tool. Um, and I'm trying to remember the name of these batteries. Uh, Eneloops, I think they're an Energizer thing. So it's N-E-N-L-O-O-P-S. And those are um, incredible. And Amazon, was making their own version of them for a lot cheaper for a while, and that's what these are. Um, but I've heard that those have gone down in quality anymore and are no longer comparable. So um, um, 
yeah, I hate like giving the names of specific brands and things, but <laughs> it's not a commercial. Um, and then uh, Lisa also asked about pre-focusing when aiming for flying insects. And I just, I, I guess predominantly I try to avoid photographing flying insects because, um, because it's really challenging and I don't, um, particularly for bees, you know, if it's something like a dragonfly, then it's a fun challenge, but a bee, something that small, um, I mostly avoid that. So that photo I showed of a flying bee, I was already photographing that on the flower. And so it, it just moved um, and the timing was right. Uh, I wouldn't have tried for that shot if I wasn't already photographing it. Um, Cause that's just, it's super challenging with subject matter that's that small. But dragonflies, things like that, um, that can be a fun challenge. Um, but no pre-focusing. Um, I'm just kind of have my have my hand on the, the focus dial and I'm just constantly moving it and and um, playing around. But you get a ton of a ton of bad shots and then a couple good ones. Okay, let's see, going through uh, some other questions in the chat. Yeah, so from Brian, um, talking about uh, considering an Olympus TG, which is kind of a point, point and shoot camera. Um, he's asking, you know, he's told it has less metadata and pixels, etc. cetera. Um, I think it's an, from what I've seen, it's a pretty excellent camera um, and has some really cool functions. Part of it just being that it's waterproof and really durable, so you don't have to worry too much about it. Um, and uh, and it has, um, as you notice, as you noted, um, some flash rings. So I think it's a, a great option, particularly if you're just kind of um, looking to, to um, jump into things and start learning um, and can take some really excellent photos. So I see really, really good photos um, taken with the Olympus TG. Um, you're right that it's not going to, it's, it doesn't give you that same breadth of options. Um, and it doesn't give you um, that same, you know, quality necessarily. It's not, you're, you're probably, what, 12, 14, 16 megapixels um, versus it would be 24, I think, in my camera. But I started out with a camera that had 16 and, and it's fine, you know, unless you're looking to blow up the photo to, you know, a really large size for printing. Um, I don't think that's a, a big consideration. So yeah, I mean, I think that's a, an excellent camera um, and worth um, taking a, a look at. So um, from Jesse, um, I'm mostly just using that standard flash, the speed light with a diffuser, that um, two headed flash that can go on the front of, the, of, of my camera. Um, I use that in the studio. Um, and that's, uh, People get excellent results with this. It just takes more um, work. The diffusers are harder to do. You definitely have to do like a homemade diffuser and figure out how um, to adequately diffuse these lights. So I use that in the studio, um, but in the field, I, I just use this. I've been using it for eight years and it, it works for me. And I'm, you know, kind of just stick with things at work a lot of the time. Um, okay. Carol's asking if I have a favorite time of day to shoot. Um, I mean, it depends, you know, for, for the subject matter, I usually photograph, um, which is going to predominantly be bees, um, you know, the time of day that they're active, which is usually the warmer part of the day. So that's really important. But in terms of, of just like the quality of light, um, evenings are excellent and some of my favorite photos in terms of at least the feel um, are you know taken in the evening so I really enjoy taking photos of uh, flowers in the evening and um, then I can really dial back the flash and get kind of that natural golden light um, I think that creates really nice photos um, so yeah but What's great about the flash is you don't have to worry so much about the light, the harsh light at least, in the middle of the day. 
settings for size of photo. Um, I just, I just um, stick with the standard size of my camera. So uh, I think this one produces something like 6,000 by 4,000 pixels. Um, so uh, large photos. Um, and I don't do much printing of my photos. Um, but I imagine they could print at, at pretty large sizes. Um, so I just stick with the standard. You know, I think um, there's no reason to go any smaller than what your camera produces, um, just kind of as a standard. Um, you can always crop more. Um, and while I don't do very much cropping, um, it can be a, a good way to um, get a little closer in on your subject or fix issues with the composition of your photo. Uh, question from Mike about upcoming workshops um, with mask. Uh, it's just going to start with some some small nature walks, basically. So um, I'll be doing one in September on um, late summer wildflowers out at the arboretum, um, and then in October, and November. Um, I haven't I haven't decided yet, but um, soon, hopefully, we'll be getting back to doing some workshops. But that's a little trickier, um, and you know, I think ideally. I'd rather not be running, you know, in-person focused workshops um, until um, until after you know we're through the pandemic. Just because we have to be uh, to do that, you've got to be close to people. Um, so uh, we'll be starting with nature walks, but then eventually moving on from there. Okay, let's see. Oh, Jesse has a good comment on the Olympus TG6 for Brian. If you didn't, if you haven't seen that yet, okay. Lisa's saying photos are too big. She has a Canon 90D, but has occasional trouble uploading because the pics are too large into things like Bumblebee Watch or iNaturalist, and that's a that's a good point. So, um, depending on how you're exporting your photos you can have just these super massive files that are, that are too big for um, a lot of services to deal with. So in that case, you might lower your export settings. It may not be the, the size of the photo per se, but just the file size. Um, so you might look at lowering your export settings. The other thing you can do there is crop it, so that it's a smaller size. Um, the Canon 90D is the new version of the camera I have. Um, I don't... I think yeah, the it, it does have a um, it does have an increase in megapixels. So your photos are probably quite a bit uh, coming out quite a bit bigger than mine would be. Um, so yeah, you may look at just downsizing a little bit. Um, I don't think you'll need to do too much of that. Um, so you might want to look at your export settings or the settings in your camera, um, and then figuring that out. A lot you can with a lot of these new cameras, and that one I know for sure you can have it take both raw images and JPEGs at the same time. Of course, that takes up more space on your memory card, but those JPEGs um, are going to be a lot smaller. Um, so if you still want the flexibility of having a raw image that you can do some heavy editing on, um, but also want a smaller JPEG to upload to places, um, your camera should be able to provide the flexibility for that um, just in its software. So you might take a look at that. Any uh, any other questions? Feel free to reach out to me. Um, if you think of a question later, feel free to just send me an email. You have my email. Oh, any any hints for sneaking up on bees? Um, yeah, that's that's a good question, um, and. No, I find bees easier to sneak up on than say um, butterflies or dragonflies. Um, I can give you some tips on sneaking up on those a little bit and it may just be coincidence and, and um, the fact that, you know, I noticed it a few times and have done it since and it's worked. But I've found that um, if you raise your camera up to your eye bef before getting too close to them and then move closer, um, they are less, um, 
they're less spooked. And that might be because there's just, you know, a lot of movement and raising something up to your face may also be because you're covering your face a little bit. And so they're not able to, um, kind of look you in the eye. Now that may be assuming way too much for how they're, um, interpreting their environment, but, um, that's just something I've noticed. So if you raise your camera up to your face first and then start moving closer to them, I've had a lot better success. With bees, they tend not to be too spooked, um, but it's easiest if you sneak up on them while they have their back turned. You know, if they're um, moving around a flower, uh, you can just kind of sidle up to them with their back turned. And I like to um, kind of get down on their level. So I'll sneak up to them and then kneel down. And um, I do that so much that um, my partner pointed out to me recently, um, that I have a callus on my left knee. She was like, what is, what, do you have a lot of dirt on your left knee? And, like, um, and that's from just kneeling down on my left knee to take uh, photos of bees. So um, I kneel down and then brace my elbow on that knee um, so I can steady the camera. Um, and that really works well for me and helps kind of sneak up a little more because then I can kneel and then lean in. Um, so that's, that's what I do. Um, focusing with bifocals. That's a good question. Um, and not one I can really answer very well because um, for the time being, I don't need glasses. Um, so I don't have a lot of experience with that. Um, and I don't think I can give great tips for that. Um, a lot of the cameras have a live view which allows for focusing through the live view. Um, in fact, mirrorless cameras only have, you know, a live electronic view. And uh, that, that can be really helpful because then you're not having to look through the viewfinder, um, but you're just looking at the live view. So um, with cameras like the 80D or the 90D, you can turn that live view on um, and then just use that to focus. Um, it's a little trickier. I don't like it personally, but um, that's that's a, a definite option. Any other questions? All right. I think, uh, oh, is there one more? No. All right. Thank you all for, for coming. Um, and yeah, again, feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions, um, whether that's about, you know, equipment or techniques, um, you have my email. And so with that, I think we'll, we'll wrap it up and have a great, great weekend. Thank you, August. This was wonderful. Fabulously informative.